Good afternoon. We start this afternoon with portfolio questions on communities and local government. The first question from Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with local authorities regarding any expected increase in demand for social work services over the next 12 months. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. The Scottish Government has regular engagement with COSLA, including bilateral meetings between the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport and the COSLA Spokesperson for Health and Social Care, which consider a wide range of issues, including demand for social work services. Negotiations on the annual local government uh, finance settlement are conducted between the Scottish Government and COSLA on behalf of all 32 local authorities. In 2019-20, we are increasing our investment in social care and integration to exceed £700 million, underlining our commitment to support older and disabled people and recognise the vital role unpaid carers play. Daniel Johnson. The presumption against a uh, short sentence is an important policy move, but one that requires support from criminal justice social work. Um, I was therefore wondering if the government could uh, tell the chamber how many criminal justice social workers there are currently and whether there is any anticipated increase in demand for criminal justice social workers because of the move towards a presumption against 12-month sentences and indeed whether any increase in demand for criminal justice social workers was experienced with the move to uh, the presumption against three-month sentences. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I thank uh, Daniel Don Johnson for the question and also to highlight a very important issue around how we uh, approach the, our criminal justice system and how we make sure that we rehabilitate people and how we support them and of course he does point out that there will be a shift in how we approach that more generally across all services it will require a multi-agency approach um, I don't have the specific figures that he likes uh, he would he requests I can uh, will make sure that we can endeavour to uh, get those figures in the detail that he requires. The social services workforce is 2,019, uh, uh, that's 7.7% of all Scottish employment. The workforce headcount has increased by 2.6% overall since 2008, so there has been an upward increase. The specifics beyond that, though, I don't have the detail of wealth, and I'll endeavour to make sure that uh, Daniel Johnson is furnished with those um, uh, those figures, but also to undertake that this is a cross-portfolio uh, approach and it will, of course, require me to work with um, my colleagues across uh, government, including Hamza Youssef and Jean Freeman, on these issues which uh, impact on people's lives. Thank you. Question number two, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it will give to revising the open market shared equity scheme thresholds in order to address varying house prices within local authority areas. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, new threshold areas and prices for the op Open Market Shared Equity Scheme, OMSI, were implemented in December 2018, following consultation with local authorities and COSLA. The new threshold prices are based on the most recent house price data available. They ensure the scheme continues to be targeted at those who need help to access the affordable housing market and to ensure that all areas are able to benefit from a viable scheme with a reasonable number of purchases. We will monitor the impact of these changes and threshold prices uh, will be reviewed on an annual basis. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can, can I say to the Minister that it's quite clear in the case of East Kilbride that it's not targeted and that therefore all areas are not taken into consideration. I have been uh, writing to respective governments, Scottish governments, about this for many, many years now in relation to the rent to mortgage scheme and now in relation to people who wish to get on the home ownership ladder with help from what seems on the surface of an excellent scheme. Um, people in East Kilbride, where the house prices are higher than the rest of South Lanarkshire, have been even further disadvantaged by the fact that the threshold has now dropped. Could I ask that the Minister looks at this sooner rather than later, and certainly earlier than a year's time? Minister. Um, President Officer, I thank Ms Fabiani for her question, uh, and I know that she has been pretty tenacious in, uh, on this subject on behalf of her constituents. Um, what we did in terms of the recent review uh, was to increase the number of threshold areas um, from 28 to 38, um, which uh, reflects the subdivision of larger threshold areas into, local, into individual local authorities, uh, which uh, better support local markets. The Lanarkshire threshold area was divided into uh, North and South Lanarkshire, uh, and while that has been beneficial for many, 
uh, it may be the case that it hasn't been quite so beneficial um, for East Kilbride. Um, increasing the uh, amount of threshold areas and, and prices um, to a great degree would be very complex to administer um, and quite difficult in some cases for buyers to understand and it would undermine the original principle of the scheme itself. Um, what I will say to uh, Ms Fabiani though is that I'm uh, more than willing uh, to meet with her to speak about the situation um, that she uh, has come across in her own constituency uh, in East Kilbride and I will continue to keep all of these uh, matters under review because I want as many people as possible, first time buyers, to benefit from this scheme. Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I wonder if the minister could tell me by what metric it is decided that properties in a given area should be subject to a golden share and how agreements to determine golden share properties are reached between the Scottish Government and local authorities. Minister. Um, I thank Ms Ballantyne for her question. Um, I am unable to give her uh, a direct answer and would have to look at each individual local authority and its agreement um, with the Scottish Government. Um, if she uh, wants uh, particular details, if she could drop me a note, um, I'm more than happy to respond to that. Um, if she just wants a general overview of that, I'm happy to, to write to her, but uh, I'll talk to Ms Ballantyne uh, at the end of this to see how she wants to approach that. And Polly McNeill. Has the Minister considered putting uh, more resources into the Open Market Shared Equity Scheme to improve the profile of it, particularly because the scheme promotes the existing homes and not just um, new homes, whereas the Help to Buy scheme seems to focus on first-time buyers and new homes? Does the Minister agree that we need to ensure that we are promoting existing homes as well as new homes for first-time buyers? Yes. Um, I agree with Ms McNeill that we need to promote uh, uh, all of the schemes in, in terms of help to buy, in, including OMSI. Um, in 2018-19, um, we have budgeted for £70 million pounds for, for OMSI. Um, what we are seeing uh, with that scheme is that 75% of the folk who are applying um, are aged 18 to 35. 99% of those folks are first-time buyers, the others uh, being from Priority Access Group, and the average household income uh, of uh, those folks is £24,000. Uh, this is a scheme that has benefited uh, many people right across the country, um, uh, and I I'm quite happy uh, to ensure uh, that we continue to promote that and the other help-to-buy schemes that we have in place. Question number three, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it provides support for residents of sheltered housing complexes who find themselves the victims of sustained abuse by other residents. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. <clears throat> Thank you. Abuse in our communities is unacceptable and we recognise that tackling this issue requires a multi-agency multi approach. Individual landlords, councils and the police all have responsibilities for tackling antisocial behaviour in social housing. Councils can use antisocial behaviour orders to ban abusers from places or contact with people. The police and courts can deal with threatening or abusive behaviour. Councils and other public bodies must, under current legislation, act to support and protect adults at risk of harm. Alison Harris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and, as she will be aware, abuse can come in many forms. I have been contacted by elderly residents from one particular sheltered housing complex in the Falkirk area who have grave concerns with the level of support that their housing association is providing. They have been repeatedly subject to mental and physical abuse by others in the complex and, have, and some have become too frightened to leave their own homes. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this should not be allowed to happen and could she advise me on what I can say to these residents so that they feel free from say, feel free and feel free from you know and safe from isolation? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, and I, I appreciate uh, Alison Harris for raising this this issue. And of course, I'm sure it will be of interest as well to my colleague Christina McKelvey with responsibility for for older people as well. I'm happy to meet with uh, Alison Harris if that uh, uh, would assist with her, because it might be that there are different ways in which this can be approached depending on whether it's a a council property, whether it's owner-occupier, the whole host of different ways in which that could be approached. Nonetheless, regardless of that, the antisocial behaviour order and the legislation that underpins that 
is one way and one route by which people can raise concerns. Nonetheless, there is also a, con a number of complexities around uh, the way in which uh, behaviour such as this manifests itself with our older population will require uh, a lot of delicate handling and sensitivity. Uh, and I extend that offer to Alison Harris to meet with her to understand uh, the context a bit more fully uh, and to make sure that we can work with her to support her constituents. Question number four, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve fire safety standards, including requiring domestic properties to be equipped with smoke, heat and carbon monoxide alarms. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government is committed to achieving uh, improved fire safety. Uh, in June 2017, following the Grenfell Tower tragedy, the Scottish Government took immediate steps to establish a ministerial working group on building and fire safety. The group has agreed a number of recommendations to improve building and fire safety, including lowering the height of buildings on which cladding must be non-combustible or pass a full-scale fire test, extending the mandatory installation of sprinklers in flats and in larger multi-occupancy dwellings and those which provide care, and specific fire safety guidance to residents of high-rise domestic buildings and the introduction of guidance for fire risk assessments. These measures are in addition to the new minimum standard for fire and carbon monox monoxide detection for all homes, which comes into force in February 2021. Gil Patterson. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Does the Minister agree that a single death from residential fires is one too many, and that these improvement standards will help ensure that residents in my constituency of Clydebank and Mulgay and indeed across the whole of Scotland benefit from high level of protection, irrespective of where they live and if it's private or social or new built homes. And this should indeed be promoted extensively by this parliament and everyone else. Yes. Um, President officer, I agree completely uh, with Mr. Patterson that one death from fire in Scotland is one too many. Uh, significant progress has been made uh, uh, in fire safety. And as we look to realise our vision uh, for safer and stronger communities across Scotland, uh, with a long-term decrease in both the number and rate of uh, fatal fire casualties. However, uh, none of us can be complacent about this. Uh, fire alarms are proven to save lives and are one of the most important investments uh, you can make to protect life and property. Through the improved standard for fire and carbon monoxide detection, we can ensure that everyone will benefit from the same high level of protection, whether you own your home or rent uh, from a private or social landlord. Uh, and I, I really do thank uh, Mr. Patterson uh, for talking about promotion, because I think it's up to each and every one of us uh, to promote these changes and to ensure um, that people uh, adhere um, to uh, the, the new standards that we are setting. Uh, and I'm happy uh, to talk to any member uh, around about how we can help them promote the scheme. Thank you. Question five, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what funding it gives to local authorities for the provision of community services. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, the Scottish Government's 2019-20 budget will provide local government with overall funding totalling more than £11.6 billion. The vast majority of this funding is not allocated for individual services as, as it is the responsibility of individual local authorities to manage their own budgets and to allocate the total financial resources available to them, including for the range of community services they deliver on the basis of local needs and priorities having first fulfilled their statutory obligations and the jointly agreed set of national and local priorities. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Is she aware that, according to public sector trade unions, over 31,000 local government jobs have been lost in Scotland since 2008, which means 31,000 fewer people providing services direct to the local communities, putting growing pressure on those who remain in work and resulting in community, library and leisure centre closures, along with reduced staffing and reduced hours in, in those that remain open? And since this undoubtedly has an impact on government policy on issues like health and wellbeing, loneliness and isolation and obesity. Could the Cabinet Secretary indicate how the Scottish Government intends to audit the impact of community, library and leisure centre closures, please? Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, the work between local government and national government and our aspirations are jointly held. Those are articulated through a national performance framework uh, by which we will uh, ensure that we can deliver on the uh, key uh, criteria set out with that. And that also includes things like wellbeing and undoubtedly some of the, uh, the issues that uh, Elaine Smith points to around uh, libraries, leisure facilities are undoubtedly part of that sense of wellbeing that we feel uh, within our communities. Uh, we have done what we can to protect local government uh, as best we can and that's why there has been uh, uh, we have provided that councils have more resources in revenue terms and capital terms and overall uh, I, again though the budget which was passed just a week ago enhanced our uh, offer to local governments to help them support and provide the services that their communities need and to respond to the needs of their communities uh, I don't think though however that the Labour Party came up with any proposals in which they, they would choose to help fund the issues that Elaine Smith articulates in order to uh, ensure that people can continue uh, to enjoy the facilities across uh, our councils. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. D does the Cabinet Secretary share the view of COSLA, which told the Local Government and Communities Committee on 9th of January that, and I quote, it is evident that councils are collapsing in England and Wales. We would absolutely not want that level of cuts to Scottish budgets. And can she outline what Scottish ministers have done to protect local government budgets in Scotland from what has happened in England under the Tories and Wales under Labour? Mr. Secretary. I think the member makes a, a very good point and we do share the view taken by COSLA uh, around the, their analysis of what has happened to local authorities across England because they have faced real terms budget reductions of 28% over the period of 2011 to 2018. In comparison, we have endeavoured to protect and treat fairly uh, local government in Scotland. I've, I've talked around the £11.6 billion total funding that goes to uh, local government uh, in Scotland, the fact that we work in partnership to deliver the aspirations set out in the national performance framework, uh, the fact that we have engaged with the Green Party colleagues to make sure that we can work to create a budget that works for the whole of Scotland. And for other parties to criticise this in the face of what their own parties are doing in other parts of the UK, we will continue to work hard with local government, protect and treat fairly local government and support the good work that they do delivering for uh, our communities across the country. And uh, Kenneth Gibson is absolutely right to make sure that we always and never, never forget the difference of approach between this government and other parts of the UK. Question number six, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether its target to build 50,000 new affordable homes will be met. Minister Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. We are making excellent progress in, uh, uh, towards our target of delivering 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 of which will be for social rent. The most recent published quarterly housing statistics show that since April 2016 to the end of September 2018, uh, we have delivered 19,400 affordable homes, 11,825 of which are for social rent, keeping us well on track to deliver our ambitious target over the course of this parliament. Uh, this government can be uh, very proud of its record in affordable housing, having now delivered more than 80 thousand affordable homes since 2007. John Scott. Um, I thank the Minister for his answer, but the, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware the SNP's 2016 manifesto stated that over the next Parliament we will invest £3 billion to build at least 50,000 more affordable homes. Now, you say you've delivered 19,000, uh, but not delivered 50,000 more affordable homes in the built environment. So, could the Minister give us the real figures, how many new affordable homes will be built over this Parliament, and is it anywhere close to the 50,000 target, please? Minister. Um, the majority of homes provided uh, through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme uh, will be new built. Uh, but the programme also includes rehabilitation projects, off-the-shelf purchases, and homes for low-cost home ownership from existing housing stock. Reflecting this mix, uh, we have always referred to the delivery uh, of more affordable homes. And we've allowed that um, because many local authorities have allowed, asked us for the flexibility to allow them uh, to uh, buy back stock in certain places uh, so that they have the right housing, the right affordable and social housing uh, in their areas. Um, and I would have thought uh, that Mr. Scott would have uh, liked uh, that idea of localism uh, because yeah. that has been punted uh, by the Conservatives for so long. In Mr. Um, Scott's 
constituency. Um, we have uh, completed projects um, through Ayrshire Housing, Hanover Housing Association uh, and South Ayrshire Council, such as Lemons Wines, Dunham Road, uh, Lochside um, and uh, many others in Ayr. Um, and we're currently on site in Peeble Street uh, and Whitlet's, Whitlet's Primary School, James Brown Avenue. And in Troon, Errol's Green Phase 1 has been completed by the West of Scotland Housing Association and uh, Phase 2 is now going on. That's good news for Ayr, that's good news for the whole of Scotland, which is benefiting from this ambitious housing programme. Thank you. Apologies to Mr Mason and the uh, subsequent questioners. We didn't get a lot of progress. I just encourage more succinct supplementary questions, more succinct answers. We turn to social security and older people. Question number one, Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to ensure that the Social Security Scotland has a diverse workforce that represents our society. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Social Security Scotland is working with a wide range of stakeholders to recruit a diverse workforce. This includes practical measures such as developing accessible job descriptions and adverts and removing barriers such as qualification requirements for entry level roles to broaden the applicant pool, as well as offering feedback to un unsuccessful candidates to support and encourage them to reapply for future roles. Social Security Scotland has also undertaken outreach activities to promote jobs to the wider community and provide practical support to potential applicants that are happening in areas where roles are based. Ruth McGuire. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. A notable commitment in the Social Security Charter includes involving those with lived experience in measuring performance. Can the Cabinet Secretary expand on how they will measure success in respect of recruiting a diverse workforce? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Ms McGuire is quite right to point to the Social Security Charter that embeds absolutely everything that this government and the agency does on Social Security. Uh, the agency is working to publish data on its workforce to ensure transparency and to drive continuous improvement in its selection process. Uh, we have seen progress in these areas, but we are never complacent and we're always open to do more to work with stakeholder um, organisations, for example, and others to review the progress that we've made to date and to see what more can be done to um, improve further. And this is a process which both myself and the agency are very committed to uh, achieving. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Anas Sarwar. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask for the Cabinet Secretary, of the new people working for the agency, how many of them previously worked from DWP and what percentage of the new workforce does that make up? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the agency does not collect statistics on um, the, the last employment place that people are coming from. What we do ensure is that every single person that comes through the door um, is committed to the um, established uh, fairness, dignity and respect agenda that we have. Um, every single person is um, um, assessed on their ability to ensure that they carry that out. That's done through the, the um, application process, through the recruitment and then through induction and continuous professional development. Um, and I'm proud that um, everyone who has chosen to come and work for our agency is doing just that. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm how many members of the Executive Advisory Board are members of a diverse minority background? And can she also outline what steps she has taken to in increase the diversity of the panels um, and also in terms of the leadership of the Social Security Scotland and the Associated Commission? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I think this is uh, something which, although the agency is moving in the right direction, and we do have to do work on, and I would, um, of course, pay tribute to um, the, the work that Anna Sarwar has been uh, doing on this, and particularly um, his, his um, er earlier coverage on this, um, I think, a couple of, of weeks um, ago. Um, I'd be happy to, to correspond with the member directly um, on this and to ensure that he's put in touch with the agency to carry on these conversations, uh, because it is something which, although I think we have taken uh, steps to address some of those areas, um, quite clearly there is there's more that we can do on that, and we're very open to those discussions. Question number two, Bill Bowman. Yeah, thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to meet the commitment in the Social Security Charter for the system to be efficient and deliver value for money. Cabinet Secretary. We are committed to funding Social Security to ensure we deliver a service based on dignity and respect, that it is an investment in the people of Scotland and provides clear value for money for the public purse. 
Affordability and value for money are key considerations through our decision-making process. All resource commitments and investment decisions are subject to the development of robust business cases that fully consider evidence-based options appraisals and value for money in line with the Scottish Public Finance Manual. We produce forecasts of benefits to support policy development, evaluation, delivery costs and financial management, and we consider the implications for each system change and the impact on the whole of the Scottish budget. Bill Bowman. Thank you for that answer. The Scottish Government is consulting on the job grant, which is stated to be for youngsters, specifically for people between 16 to 24 years old. Dundee, in my region, has the lowest employment rate in Scotland, and there are significant numbers of older people who are out of work, a situation which is worsening with recent company closures at Mitchell and McGill's and further possible redundancies following the SNP Council budget cuts or as evidenced in the worrying statistic that one in 10 people in Dundee have never, ever held a job. Taking this into, the, into account, can the Minister explain the fairness of this discrimination against the older job market and this grant being solely offered to younger people? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the proposed job grant um, is but one aspect of the work that this government undertakes, um, particularly under my colleague Jerry Hepburn, Jimmy Hepburn, to work um, to ensure that we are supporting um, all of those um, who are seeking um, to either return to the job market um, or are needing additional to support to, to move on. Uh, I'm disappointed um, to, uh, that uh, this, this job grant is being viewed in, in such a manner. Uh, but if the Conservatives were genuinely interested in broadening it out or genuinely interested um, in another proposal, I would have expected to see the details of that during the Scottish budget process, and I didn't see them. So if the member genuinely um, has an area which he would wish the Scottish Government to look on, um, I would look forward to seeing the details of it and particularly how he would choose to fund it. Shona Robertson to be following Mark Griffin. I think the Cabinet Secretary will be waiting quite a while for that, but uh, the Charter was uh, co-produced by people with lived experience of the system and promises to treat everyone with dignity and respect. So can the Cabinet Secretary outline in more detail how this approach differs from the UK social security system, which has, of course, been severely criticised by the UN. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Sean Robertson is quite right to point out to the concerns which uh, the UN and uh, most recently the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights has had um, around the DWP system and its impact on individuals. Uh, I, I would again um, refer Ms Robertson to the Charter, which I know she is uh, fully aware of as a member of the Social Security Committee, and that is a direct response to ensure that we never ever get into a position in Scotland where Social Security is seen in, in anything but um, a, a human right um, and that we treat everyone going forward from this approach with dignity and respect to ensure that they get the money and the payments that they are entitled to. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Sending £6 million pounds to the DWP to administer carers' allowance and also giving up any ability to change any of the rules around the allowance doesn't seem to me to be um, value for money. Can the Cabinet Secretary rule out any agency arrangements for disability benefits and say um, if she will end the agency arrangements for carers allowance at the, the soonest possible opportunity? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we'll look very carefully at any uh, agency agreement uh, that we undertake, but I would again gently remind the member that it is because we undertook an agency agreement with the DWP that allowed us um, only a matter of weeks after the Social Security Act received its royal assent to begin paying the carers allowance supplement. Yeah. We would not have been able to do that had we had to wait for a process of having a carers allowance uh, programme and a delivery mechanism for that in place. So the choice is simple. We can do it with an agency agreement with the DWP continue to pay carers allowance and we have an investment um, of £33 million into carers allowance supplement or you don't. Um, and our choice was very, very simple, that we made sure that the money went into carers' pockets as quickly as possible. Um, and that was the right decision for us to make. Absolutely. Question three has not been lodged. Question four, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports men's sheds. 
Minister Christine McKelvey. Uh, the Scottish Government supports the National Men's Sheds movement in a variety of ways. We provide core funding to the Scottish Men's Shed Association, which supports individual men's sheds on the wide range of uh, practical issues such as start-up, health and safety and asset management. We also support local shed development, are currently running a series of regional events to support both local partners and shedders alike, encouraging a place-based partnership approach to social, tackling social isolation and loneliness, improving the mental and physical health. And can I say the Scottish Men's Shed Association has been a key stakeholder in the development of the social isolation and loneliness strategy. So I hope that this will encourage others to be involved in their own local men's sheds and add to the 164 that we currently have here in Scotland. Finley Carson. Thank the Minister for that answer. The men's shed movement has been established for many years now and in my constituency of Gallery in Western Freeze, Dobita's men's shed has over 50 members and it's an example of a unique place where men can come together and socialise with a purpose providing a positive impact on men's mental health and well-being. Shedders are an autonomous bunch, with each shed being run by the men themselves with their own rules and policies. Can the Scottish Government confirm to the shedders at Dobete and indeed across Scotland that there will be no change to this self-rule if funding is allocated directly from the Scottish Government in the future? Yes, sir. Um, I, I'm, I'm well aware of uh, there's two men's sheds that are both in WT and Stranraer. I know Stranraer is having an event coming up soon. I think uh, my colleague Emma Harper is going to that. We absolutely agree that the Men's Shed Association should maintain their autonomy and their independence. And I'm happy to work with them on those issues. So if you've got a specific issue that you think is happening with WT, happy to listen to it and work with the Men's Shed Association and Finlay Carson to deal with that. Thank you. And Lee MacArthur. Hey. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Um, the Minister will be aware of the contribution, as Finlay Carson said, of men's sheds like Orkney Men's Shed uh, to improving not just social isolation but tackling uh, mental ill health. What discussions um, has she had with her health colleagues uh, about the possibility of funding uh, being attracted a, a, at a local level uh, from health boards into supporting local men's sheds? Minister. Um, it's, that's, it's an interesting um, uh, perspective to look at it from because we already work really closely with lots of um, community partnership organisations. Age Scotland, for instance, the Glasgow Caledonian University Community Ownership Support Services, local authorities and the third sector. If there's merit in uh, speaking to the, my health colleagues on that, I'm happy uh, to hear that, but I can see the benefit in it because in social isolation and loneliness, some of the symptoms of that it can exacerbate a mental health issue or can actually be the cause of it. So if there's ways to work together in order to minimise some of that, I'm happy to hear it. And question number five, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government by what date it will publish its draft regulations for disability assistance. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. People who rely on disability benefits have consistently told us that what matters most to them is that they are paid the right amount of money on time. So the most important consideration will be to ensure a safe and secure transition of all the benefits from the DWP. The timetable and delivery schedule will be announced in due course and the publication of draft regulations will be subject to that timetable and delivery schedule. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her non-answer. Um, having hosted a meeting with many leading third sector disability organisations recently, we all welcome the Scottish Government's consultation on disability regulations. But will the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that without a clear date or timescale for publishing these draft regulations, the Scottish Government is causing unnecessary suffering and concern for, for many vulnerable people who are in receipt of these benefits? Is this way the Scottish Government wants to lead on the principle of treating Scottish people with dignity, fairness and respect? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know what actually a lot of disabled uh, people speak to me about is the absolutely inhumane and degrading treatment that they suffer at the hands of the DWP yeah. day in, day out. And that is why we are determined to ensure that when we deliver our disability benefits to Social Security Scotland, it will be a radically different approach to ensure that they are treated with dignity, fairness and respect. And when we do so and launch the consultation on disability benefits, I'm sure that those um, who have experience of the current DWP system will see a marked and welcome difference uh, to what we are proposing than what they are suffering at the moment. Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, like many others, I welcomed the announcement last year that there will be no private sector involvement in the disability assessment process. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell us why it's vital to take a different approach to the UK Government's often cruel and humiliating assessment regime? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, Ruth McGuire is, is quite right to, to point out the, the cruel aspects of the assessment process, which is why it's one of the areas which the government has already announced it will make key changes to, ensuring that um, there is no private sector um, involvement, um, also to ensure that the assessment process is fairer, based on standards rather than case volumes. The agency will undertake the assessments, will provide a flexible service, including home visits when required. We'll ensure that assessment process works effectively for people who, whatever their condition or their disability. And when we do that, and when we build our system on, culture, on a culture of dignity and respect, uh, that will flow through the attitude of the assessment staff and that will ensure uh, that those who have to um, apply on, uh, to Social Security Scotland will uh, know that they will be supported through that process um, rather than being treated in an inhumane and undignified manner as they do day in, day out through the DWP. Question number six, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the impact will be on older people in Scotland of the UK Government's use of universal credit to limit entitlement to pension credit. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we fundamentally disagree with the UK Government's decision to make this policy change, which is expected to leave pensioners as much as £7,000 a year worse off simply because they have a younger partner. Thousands of couples in Scotland are expected to be hit by this policy over the coming years, with the UK Government expecting 15,000 couples across the UK to be affected this year alone. I have written to the UK Government about this matter, outlining my concerns and asking for clarity on the impact that this will have. Bill Kidd. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that information. Independent analysis from SPICE found that 10% of households in Scotland claiming pension credit are likely to be affected. Does the Minister agree that this severe and unfair cut is widespread in its reach, affecting many families who will have little to no means to adjust to this sudden drop in their income? Press Secretary. Well, I completely um, agree with Bill Kidd on this issue. Once this policy comes into place, the families that are affected by it will find themselves much worse off than they could have anticipated. They'll no longer be entitled to claim pension credit, will be forced to claim universal credit, which is, of course, much less generous for couples than the pension credit. We know already that universal credit is causing problems and members across the chambers will see that in their surgeries and in their mailbags. It's causing problems for people who are claiming it and its introduction has led to an increase in rent arrears and forced people into hardship. That is something which even the Secretary of State has admitted has led to an increase in hardship and use of food banks only in the last couple of weeks. Question number seven, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that social security claimants have access to representation at tribunals. Cabinet Secretary. We recognise that allowing people to have access to a representative at a tribunal hearing is an important aspect of the rights-based approach. The procedural rules for the Social Security Chamber ensure individuals can be represented and also allow them to be accompanied by a supporter at their hearing. Ian Gray. Uh, I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but the problem, of course, is access to someone to provide uh, that support. The Scottish Legal Aid Board's cutting of their Making Advice Work programme uh, has means that across the Lothians and borders, 12 experienced and highly skilled frontline workers are about to lose their positions. It will leave my constituents uh, with almost no access to anyone with the experience to represent them at tribunals. Will the Cabinet Secretary get slab to reverse this decision? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do recognise that a difficult decision has um, had to be taken uh, not to continue funding for some Scottish Legal Aid Board advice projects, but the Scottish Government does continue to provide £2.7 million pounds worth to fund 27 advice projects across the country. Uh, SLAB has always been very clear in its communications that rolling funding um, has never been intended and that these projects uh, should not be seen um, as using this as core funding for uh, the organisations. But certainly from Social Security Scotland's point of view, we will do all we can within the agency to ensure uh, that an individual has help with their appeal, including providing information and signposting to organisations who will be able to um, assist them further. Um, and that is built into the process that the agency uh, delivers um, as it goes through its determinations. And question number eight, Alison Johnson. 
thank you to ask the Scottish Government how it will minimise erroneous underpayment of devolved social security assistance. Cabinet Secretary. Our focus is on paying people the uh, on paying the right people the right money at the right time. Social Security Scotland has put in place a range of robust measures to prevent errors from occurring. This includes clear pre-claim guidance for clients to ensure we all have the right information from the outset and clear technical guidance for our staff alongside ongoing training and support to help them make the right decision first time. We also ensure we have a robust checking process for applications. Um, if an error is made, we'll put it right and we will learn from those mistakes, ensuring we continually strive to improve our service. Alison Johnson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. We're advised that claimant error is mostly due to failing to keep the DWP aware of a deterioration in a functional need. Um, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's comments about pre-claim guidance, but what specific support will be given to people to complete their applications fully and accurately, and very importantly, to keep Social Security Scotland up to date with their needs? And what quality assurance will be put in place to monitor official errors. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Alison Johnson is quite right to point out that the vast majority of underpayments for PIP and DLA in the reserve benefit system are caused by people already on a benefit um, failing to report an increase in their care or mobility um, needs and therefore losing out. This will come um, down a great deal to the, the culture that we have within the agency, um, which will build up um, a level of trust between the agency um, and be between um, recipients um, of payments uh, to ensure that they are encouraged to come forward and they see that in a supportive manner and that the agency is there to ensure that they get the money that they are entitled to. Um, and this aspect is a, a very important aspect um, of the underpayments work that we're committed to undertake. Thank you very much. And that concludes portfolio questions. We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 16012 in the name of Mark Griffin on the Carers Allowance Supplement. And I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.